and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Raymond Arroyo. Oh, good evening, everyone. I think I've, I've, I've met many of you in this audience. For those I haven't had the chance to meet, my name is John Highbush, and I have the honor of being the executive director of the Ronald Reagan Presidential Foundation and Institute. Thanks for coming out this evening. In honor of our men and women in, in uniform who defend our freedoms around the world, if you please stand and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thanks. Please be seated. While I know that Ray Arroyo is here today to promote the newest book in his famous Will Wilder series, it would be impossible to properly introduce him without mention of the remarkable success he has achieved on so many fronts. Many of you, uh, particularly fans of Fox News, might have seen Ray regularly on various programs there, certainly including Laura Ingraham's terrific show. But I also know that many of you will clearly recognize Ray for another singular achievement, and that being his founding, of course, of the EWTN, uh, EWTN uh, Global Catholic Network. You, amongst many, are among the millions and millions seen or uh, who have seen or heard of uh, Ray for many years there. As its founding news director, managing editor, lead anchor, for over 20 years, he has built the network into a powerhouse broadcaster, positively affecting the lives of just countless numbers of people. He is multi-talented. I envy him. <laughs> But where the viewer or listener knows him at his very best is as an interviewer, a historic interviewer. His guests over the years, uh, there are truly too many to list. But some of you will remember when he, he interviewed Mother Teresa of Calcutta, uh, Placido Domingo, President George W. Bush, President Donald J. Trump, Jerry Lewis, Pope Benedict XVI, it goes on and on. Always, always insightful. He has earned a reputation as being one of the best interviewers in the business, bar none. And of course, he's a New York Times best-selling author of five books as well. While on the subject of books, Ray is joining us tonight with his newest book, Will Wilder, number three, The Amulet of Power. Ladies and gentlemen, if you would, please join me in welcoming to the Reagan Library, Ray Arroyo. Thank you, Tim. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you all for coming out. I'm glad you're here. I almost didn't make it. I was in Vegas, I almost was routed to Vegas, so I'm glad I, I'm glad I made it all the way. Um, I, I, first of all, thank you. Laura sends her love for those of you who, uh, who watch the show. I was not, no Friday Follies this week. I am your Friday Follies right here. So she was very upset, I'll have you know, when I told her I was coming to the Reagan Library. Uh, not that I was coming, but that I was missing Friday Follies. So um, I, I think I get the night off, right? I mean, come on. Okay, I, I want to, there are a number of things I need to tell you, and as soon as my, my script comes up here, because I, I have notes, I don't want to forget what, I'm, what I wanted to tell you. Um, 
the first thing I want to talk about is stories. And I'm not going to bore you for long, because then John and I will do Q&A. That'll be much more exciting than this part of the program. I'll keep this brief. Um, I, I just want to talk to you for a moment about why and how I got into writing fiction and writing stories, particularly for children. Stories are very important things in our world. And I think for too many of us, um, we've lost sight. We've forgotten the power of stories. And now I have my own little memory that I, I'll start with tonight. Um, how many of you recall your mothers or fathers reading to you? You remember those moments? They're precious moments. I mean, I, when I get letters, today I've been inundated. I've, I have readers from London, and there were a group of kids in Wisconsin, and they shot a video of one of the chapters of my book acting out all the different roles. To an author, nothing could be better. I'd rather miss five New York Times lists than have that video. I mean, it's just because it shows you they're taking the story to heart. Well, when I was about 12 years old, uh, my mother, one of the first books I remember her reading to me was Peter Pan. And uh, I'm sure we all know Peter Pan. And when I was about 12, Sandy Duncan had come into town to New Orleans in a musical version of Peter Pan. And my mother bought us tickets. And the day the show was to premiere, my younger brother, who's four years younger, complained because he didn't have a ticket, so she gave hers up. And her instruction to us was, we were like in the fourth row, she said, when the show is over, take your brother's hand, go straight up the aisle, do it before everybody comes out, like during curtain call, and I'll be waiting at the top of the aisle, the main aisle of the Sanger Theater in New Orleans. I said, fine, I'll do that. So. Now, you all remember, of course, the, it's one of the saddest moments in all of literature, when Wendy grows up and Peter returns to the nursery and she says, I'm ever so much more than 20 and I've forgotten how to fly. And she can't go back. And then he cruelly takes her daughter with him and they fly out the window. So, so at the end of the musical, Sandy Duncan's flying around, and at this point, she's not just flying back and forth as she has for the two hours of the show, but she's flying out over the proscenium, and she's throwing pixie dust, and people are on their feet, and it's a euphoric moment. I grab my brother's hand, and I book up the main aisle of the Sanger Theater. Well, as I go to the back door, I, and I'll never forget, these moments are seared in, in my mind. They open the back doors, and there's my mother, and she steps in, and I see her in shadow, and she's looking up. And as I get closer, I realize she's got tears streaming down her face. And I remember telling her, Mama, what's wrong? What's wrong? And she grabbed both my brother and I, and she said, she's so beautiful up there. Look at her flying. It all goes by so fast, baby. It goes by so fast. And, of course, I knew what she meant because I remember her reading the story to me. Childhood goes by so fast, those moments of innocence. One day we turn around and, you know, we're the, we're the children. You know, we, we, we're no longer the children we're reading to children that were our age. So those moments, stories, um, I think particularly in the, in the minds and hearts of young people, they have great effect. And the tales we tell our children shape not only our future but theirs. And fiction is a lens. It's a way of seeing into the future. It's a way of processing the world that's to come in adulthood and making sense of it. Now look, it also teaches us things we don't understand about ourselves and about others. Now Jesus knew this. It's the only reason he taught only in parables. There was a reason he only spoke to people in parables. And I'll tell you a little later how science is proving all of this to be true and correct, of course. He was the Messiah, he probably knew beforehand. But um, today, I think, and, and whether it's um, uh, traditionally minded people, whether it's uh, conservatives, or uh, people who are faith-based, we've forgotten how to tell those stories. We've forgotten stories. We offer platitudes, but not stories. And this is a powerful tool. Stories have always been the supreme conveyors of truth. And when we stopped telling stories, others began. And they began whispering things into the ears of our children, things not of our construction, things that frankly are not true. And then we're shocked. We wonder, how did these kids grow up the way they did? Well, they're just following through. They're living out the stories that they've been fed for a lifetime. Now, think back to your own childhood, your favorite stories. What were they? I'll tell you mine. 
I loved Treasure Island. I read all the Sherlock Holmes books when I was a kid. Uh, Encyclopedia Brown was very big in my house, The Hobbit. What were your favorite books? Don't be shy. This is your time to talk back. Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys. Will Wilder has a lot of Hardy Boys in him. I'll tell you about that. There are, the kids say, well, I didn't know this was a mystery. Well, you know, I, I, when I was their age, all I read was mysteries. You know, mystery. And again, there's also that sense of justice I think kids love and need to know more about. And all those books had it. The bad guys were vanquished. We figured out who was good. And there was a sense of moral balance in those books. I worry in a lot of kid lit today and a lot of middle grade fiction, that world is inverted. The villains are now your heroes. And the ends are just kind of, well, you, you, you can kind of try to, you get to decide who was the hero and who was the villain. It creates a very um, stunted moral compass inside of a child, I think. And it's not what we should be giving our kids. And frankly, it's not what they enjoy. Because kids are inherently fair. They know the truth. We're the ones who are trying to <laughs> mess it up. They already, they're already on to the game. Shaping a child's imagination really is one of the most, I think, significant gifts we can give them. Stories are a window to a larger world. It teaches them sacrifice from selfishness, affection from barbarity, good from evil. And, and stories are incredible things. They make you care about people you've never met before and absorb truths that you never intended. Before you know it, the heart and the mind and the soul shifts. And I, I just believe stories are one of the most underutilized tools we have today in the world, in society, and I believe it's a key to preserving our society. Stories are so important. Think about smoking for a minute. I'm going to try to illustrate this for you quickly. Think about smoking. How many smokers in the room? Come on. Oh, one. Two. How many former smokers in the room? Aha, look, it's a, it's a forest of arms go up. Um, perhaps no social habit was as chic or cool, right, than having a cigarette. I mean, I, I, I walked in the other night, my son was watching a Humphrey Bogart movie, and he had a way of holding a cigarette from a top like this. You know, it was so cool the way he held. It, it was chic, it was sophisticated. Well, now, it, you know, it's more evil than infanticide smoking, okay? They will like throw you out of the village if you're caught smoking now. Now, for decades, the government used ads and familiar phrases, okay? Don't, sit, use, you, don't spread secondhand smoke. It's bad for your lungs. They tried all of these campaigns to get people to stop smoking. But never in the history of the Center for Disease Control did they ever see anything quite like a campaign they launched in 2012? Now, what made this different? They decided to create little mini documentaries. They were called tips from former smokers. And the first tip featured a, a lady. It was kind of a graphic piece. Her name was Terry Hall. She was a uh, oral and throat cancer survivor. She was 40 years old, showed her in a bathroom mirror, and her face is smashed like an aluminum can. And we watch her put a wig on her head, and then she puts false teeth in, and uh, she, she, the, the, her, she's got a twisted mouth, and then she puts this device in the hole in her throat, and all the while you're hearing this voiceover that's saying, read to your children while you still can before smoking takes your voice away from you. Scared the bejesus out of people. In the first airing of the ad, one airing of the ad, 100,000 people ditched cigarettes. The CDC has never seen a campaign like this. It, it ended up being their most successful. Now, why? Why was it their most successful campaign? Millions of people ended up dropping smoking because of that campaign. What was it? They told a story, and they did it without any morale, they didn't shake a finger and say, don't, don't, don't. They just showed you what would happen if you did, did, did. And it didn't look too pretty. People were naturally moved to action. For society, for we as a people to save ourselves, I believe nourishing stories filled with wonder, filled with our values, are absolutely essential and necessary. I am touched that John invited me to come here today because I remember being a child and when the Republican convention was in New Orleans, my grandmother was a delegate. 
And I will never forget going to the convention center, and then President Reagan drove in. And we were right in the front row, and I was a kid. I might have been 11, 10. And um, he got up at, at a podium, and he introduced George Bush. And he told stories. He would tell brilliant, moving, beautiful stories about our common purpose, about who we were as a people. And I believe we need that to knit us together, to knit our whole souls and hearts together. And even as a child, I knew the power of what he was saying. And you could feel it in the room. You felt one when you left that room. It's the power of a well-told story. So for me personally, I finally realized when I, when I breathed for a moment that whether I was an actor or a director, a journalist, a broadcaster, I, I was a storyteller all along. And so I was inspired to write children's books because really I wanted my own children to have something to read. And there are very few middle grade series that have an entire intact family. It's a rare thing in middle grade fiction today. Um, will Wilder is a 12 year old with a special gift. Now I will admit there are dangers to writing fiction. A lot of them. Because you walk into a restaurant. I, I often write in a corner of a coffee shop. And uh, I wrote the first book in Northern Virginia when we lived in Virginia. And every day around 3 o'clock, a lady would come in, very well-dressed lady with a briefcase. She'd get in line to get her latte, frappa, wrappa, whatever it was. And she'd look over. You know, you can feel when people are looking at you. And she'd look in the corner. Well, when I edit, I, if you've ever listened to any of my audio books, I do all the voices. I do like 33 voices on the audio books. Well, when I edit, and it's a habit of my old acting days, I will go through and read the characters and, oh, no, Will, you can't go there. Oh, but Aunt Lucille, please. But you can't do that now, dear. Go the other way. I'll edit, talking it out, so I can hear the cadence and make sure it all works. Well, this woman is looking over at me every day when she gets in line. Well, finally, after about three weeks of this, she comes over and she slides a business card next to my computer. And I look down and it says, Head of Psychiatric Services, <laughs> Johns Hopkins University. And she says, if you ever need a referral, I can help you. <laughs> she said, do you hear voices often? I said, not only that, I get paid to create them. Yes, I hear them all the time, all day long. So you never know. Uh, it, it, it really is perilous falls, you know. Uh, but whether it's a family tale that we hand down to generations or an original work of fiction, it's important that we pass good stories along to our families, to our children, to our grandchildren. I'm going to tell you a few quick stories. I love origin stories, where stories began, where stories found their genesis. Uh, there was a boy named Elwin Brooks. He lived in, um, grew up in Mount Vernon, New York, not Seattle, Mount Vernon, New York. He was a terribly shy, introverted child. He found it much easier to establish friendships with four-legged friends rather than human beings. He was just a very introverted, shy person. He wrote of himself, this boy felt for animals a kinship. He never quite felt for people, Elwin wrote. Indeed, he loved critters, mice and horses and cows and pigs and the whole sloppy, gorgeous mess of creation. Though he became an, became an accomplished essayist at the New Yorker magazine, he found it easier to channel his thoughts through animals. And when his wife got pregnant with their first child, he wrote the most beautiful letter to her in the voice of their dog, Daisy, about how excited Daisy was going to be to have a playmate, to have somebody to walk her, to have somebody to play with. Well, it was in 1947 on his farm in Brooklyn, Maine, when he intended to slaughter a pig and the animal suddenly became ill and he tried to nurse it back to health and the pig died. And he later wrote in an essay in The New Yorker, the loss we felt was not the loss of ham, but the loss of pig. But that event would scar him. While taking the pail of slops out to the new pigs, he had an inkling of an idea for a book. There was this wondrous silken sack he'd been watching grow in the corner of his barn in Brookline, Maine. And he would make notations in his diaries. He drew pictures of it every day. And then he was obsessed with the large spider that continued to spin her web around. And of course, all of this finds its way into one of the most beloved children's books, I think, of all time, and maybe a, a great American classic, Charlotte's Web. And it's probably the most profound reflection on 
self-sacrifice and love and death in a tiny little microcosm, in a, in a, little, in a little farm, a little farming community. I love how that book ends, of course I would, where, where it says, um, the last line of the book, it says, Wilbur never forgot Charlotte. Although he loved her children and grandchildren dearly, none of the new spiders ever quite took her place in his heart. She was in a class by herself. It's not often that someone comes along who's a true friend and a good writer. Charlotte was both. <laughs> E.B. White, Elwyn Brooks White, wrote of this enduring work, all that I ever hope to say in books is that I love the world, and I guess you can find that in there if you dig around. Animals are part of my world, and I report them faithfully and with respect. Charlotte's was a story of friendship and life and death and salvation. And it is, and was. The lesson in white, the important one for us to remember, to hold on to, is that there are ordinary miracles all around us if we take the time to see them. And but for writers like white, we miss those moments. We miss those shoots coming out of the ground in the spring. We miss the perfection of an egg or the beauty of a silken sack in the corner filled with life. You, you, you blow past those things. Good writing, good writers make us focus on those beautiful miracles around us, and that's important. I took my boys to a um, trip to London a few years ago, and um, while we were in England, some of the surrounding areas, um, I was really excited to learn that there was a 13-year-old boy who was enrolled in a public boarding school in England. Uh, very, it's very near the Cadbury uh, Chocolate Company. And I didn't know this, but they told me the Cadbury Chocolate Company would send little gray discreet boxes with chocolates, little slivers like wafers of chocolate, and they would have them stacked up with a note wrapped around it, and they would give it to only certain boys like two or three boys in this boarding school, to sample and taste the chocolate. And then they'd have to rate how it tasted. Lubricity, sweetness. You'd like to be one of those boys, wouldn't you? <laughs> I can tell. And the, now the boys had to promise to consume all of the chocolate and leave nothing else and to share it with no one else. That was the deal. Uh, now, Cadbury at the time was more, locked in this mortal candy combat with their competitor, Roundtree, which is just down the road. They would even send spies to each other's factory trying to get the recipes, one from the other. Now, thank God that one of those little boys in the boarding house, that public boarding house, was a boy named Roald Dahl, who would go on to write Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. His fantasies of the wondrous interior of the Cadbury factory and his loathing of ill-mannered children <laughs> conspired to create Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. And the curious thing is, Roald Dahl never stepped foot in the Cadbury Chocolate Factory. It was all his imagination. Now, I was on a subway in New York recently, and um, there was a mother and daughter across the aisle from me. And I love New York subways because everybody's reading something, usually, when they don't have their earbuds on or when they're not breakdancing in the aisle. They're, they're reading. And it was a mother and daughter, and I thought, here's a 14-year-old girl. I, I found out because I asked on their way out. And the mother and she were reading together, two separate books. The mother was reading Fifty Shades of Grey, and the daughter was reading Fifty Shades Darker. The reason I asked how old she was is because I wanted to know, because I knew I was writing this speech. She was 14 years old. Now, this is like child abuse. To allow a kid to read this kind of trash, I mean, I'm not going to, this is a family show, so I'm not getting into the details, but if you show me what kids are reading or watching or listening to today, I can tell you what your country is going to look like tomorrow and the next day and 10 years from now. This is the way we plant and build the future. People think it's politics or the law. Mm -mm -mm. It's the culture. It's the stories we tell. It's the stories we pass along and it's the ones our children absorb and take to heart. That makes the future, nothing else. Because in that sits faith and values and morality and citizenship and self-respect. It's all taught in stories, or not, or not. And that's the challenge we face today. Um, I want to run ahead to, to, because I want to give time for Q&A. We have a crisis upon us now. 
Ray Bradbury, the great author, once said, you don't have to burn books to destroy a culture. You just have to get people to stop reading them. And he's right. I launched a literacy campaign in about 2015 because I was so concerned about this. Kids were getting books. They were even getting free books, but they aren't reading them. So what we do is we bring authors into school districts, into libraries with big groups, because no one gets kids more excited about reading their story than an author, because he knows that world inside out. And we found the numbers go up when you, when you have that interaction. But it's very hard, very hard for some of these school districts to bring best-selling authors into their stores or into their libraries. So we try to facilitate that. But the challenge today is staggering. 21 million of our fellow Americans cannot read at all. 21 million. 45 million are marginally illiterate. And according to the Department of Justice, one-fifth of high school graduates, one-fifth, can't read their diploma. Let that sink in. And the implications for citizenry that simply is not literate. One in four children grow up in America without knowing how to read. And then there's this staggering, awful statistic. Maybe one of the most important things I'll tell you all night. Well, I'm going to talk about Will Wilder. The second most important thing I'm going to tell you all night. 67% of all U.S. fourth graders are below proficiency in reading. 67%. Now get this. Two thirds of students who cannot read proficiently by the end of fourth grade will end up in jail or on welfare. Two thirds. There's a very strong correlation between incarceration and illiteracy. Profound. And all sorts of other behaviors that I won't go into. The welfare and the you know, drug addiction, I mean, it goes unemployment. There are municipalities where they use fourth grade reading levels to lay out their 10-year plan for building prisons in some municipalities. Now, if we can figure out using fourth grade reading rates, if we know where that leads, why aren't we trying to stop the problem on the front end? It's a heck of a lot cheaper than getting to, to find literacy programs and to excite kids about reading or taking the time to read to them than paying for incarcerate. You know what it costs us? I pulled these statistics today because I just wrote a piece for Fox on this. $81,000, you all pay in California, $81,000 per year per inmate. Per year per inmate. Take a guess what you pay for juveniles here in California. $148,000 an inmate each year. It, it, that's what, it, there is a direct, you do pay for this. We all pay and it continues we continue to pay in lost labor, in lost uh, incentive, in lost initiative, uh, taxes lost. It, 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 it's a bleed on all sides. 22 million people are added to the adult illiterate population each year. 22 million. If a parent can't read, they can't pass the skill along to their child. And a bitter multi-generational inheritance rolls on and continues. We have to stop it. If people can't read, they can't be free. They can't understand their history or their own story. They can't be informed citizens. They can't be a vibrant moral people. Their story literally ends, and so does ours in some ways. They're cut off from the American story, and we can't let that go on. It's a really important, critical thing, and I, 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 I hope you will take the time to read to people in your community, children, the elderly, the elderly. My friend Megan Cox Gurdon, who's the um, children's review, book reviewer at the Wall Street Journal, has written a fantastic book called The Enchanted Hour. And in that book, she talks about the power, the bonds that are established when you read to a child and you put that child close to you, the proximity. There are all kinds of neurons that fire. There are all kinds of emotional connections. And as they grow, in particularly into the difficult teenage years, you have that imaginative and literary bond, an emotional bond with them that otherwise you don't get you don't have, because you've been through all these imaginative worlds, and it's not just imaginative, it's real. In here, it's real. Let me tell you the science behind this, because technology is showing so much of this to be true, and I'll rush through this. Psychologist David Kidd and Emmanuel Castano at the New School for Social Research in New York had individuals read selected excerpts of fictions and fiction, and they applied five tests. And they found that readers transferred the fictional experience, the understanding found there, 
to the real world. Here's what their paper said. The same psychological process is used to navigate fiction we use in real relationships. Fiction is not a simulator of social experience. It is a social experience. True understanding and sympathy for others, empathy, are born in every story you read. Because you're, connect, you're literally walking in the body. You're not walking in their shoes. You're walking in the body of other characters, other people in other places that you'd never go. This is the most fascinating thing. I was at Princeton years ago. My son didn't get in, but we went. And he's at Notre Dame. Don't cry for Alex. But um, got to get a water. Um, we went to Princeton, and the girl who was leading the tour was in a research unit. She found out I was an author, and she walked me over to the, the unit where they were doing this research, and the professor gave me this entire packet of papers. It's the best thing I ever got out of Princeton, and the best thing I ever got out of a college tour, I'll tell you. Here's what they found. They put individuals in an MRI, and they told all of them the same stories through earbuds. They read them the same chapter of Charles Dickens. Okay? Their brains engaged in the same zone at the same time as the story was read. Their breathing and blood flow unify. Now these are Chinese people, black people, white people, poor people, rich people, middle class, upper class. They had like 800 people they put in the MRI. The blood flow unified, the breathing unified, achieving what the researchers called and what Ronald Reagan and Jesus already knew, brain synchronicity. Beyond politics or prejudices, the story had the power to get people's brains to react in the same way at the same time. Story's not just entertaining. It's a brain device with deep and important persuasive powers. Now, I know this, and there are other people with far more insidious ends who know it too. We better get caught up. Because if you want to know why the culture's shifting and changing so rapidly, I can tell you why. What? stories are people taking into their little brain box. That tells the tale. So my Will Wilder series really was born um, where they're all born. I, I, I often say Will Wilder was a soap opera because he started at bath time for my kids just to keep them entertained and to move along to the next step in the bathing process. They always wanted a story at bath time. I told them about this wacky family. I named the kid, it was originally not Will Wilder, but there was always an Aunt Lucille and a Mr. Bartimaeus. And there were a cast of characters that I kind of fell in love with because I told these stories over many years. And then what I would do is create cliffhangers to get them out of the tub and dried and then to get them into pajamas. So I wouldn't tell them how the story went until they moved to, and then to bed was the last, well, when you go to bed and after you say your prayers, I'll tell you the end of the story, and that's how it worked. So Will Wilder is this adventurer. He's a mischievous, headstrong, slightly cocky kid. I don't know where that came from. Um, he, he, you know, he bungles into these slapstick adventures, but there are supernatural elements, even scary elements, that kids really like, I discovered. My kids love it. I love reading kind of scary, not, not gory, not nasty, but scary stories. Adults are much more scared of my stories than the kids are. They really are. Um, and the, well, the reason for that is, my, you know, my friend um, Bill Blatty read the book and he said, oh, there's a lot of reality in this book. Bill Blatty wrote The Exorcist. And, um, and, and, and I, I, did, I did a lot of research. I mean, I did, there, there are real relics here as, as Rick Reardon's series Percy Jackson is set around Greek mythology, and J.K. Rawlings is around witchcraft. Mine is around relics and ancient Western antiquities. That's the centerpiece of my series. But I have, the difference between those two guys and me is my things are real. Many of the relics I deal with are real, and the places are real. So the kids are getting history, and they're getting theology, and they're getting backstory, and it's about the entire family and how none of us just drop here. We're not alone. We come with a past and we come with a future. And the, I, I've always loved the idea that what our great-grandparents did, what our grandparents did, what our parents did, that affects us in profound ways. And Will discovers that. Every book opens with his great-grandfather in World War II battling to get these relics from very dark forces that want them. And we don't quite know what the battle is about, but there's something serious going on there. His great-grandfather built a museum in the middle of the town, and Will now has access to many of these relics, and the town is beset by really fearsome demons and dark forces, and Will, at 12 years old, is the only one who can see them. 
Now, someone asked me one time, why would you write about a 12-year-old kid who can see demons? I mean, you work in Washington, D.C., and you've been covering the Vatican for 20 years. Why would you do that? Take a guess is my answer. So I want to wrap up. Um, whether, whether it is uh, the, the story of a pig who loved spiders or honorary kids who get what they deserve for, in a chocolate factory, these bits of life, these bits of universal emotions and characters, humor and pathos, they make us human. They teach us to be human again. Um, I think it's really important for each of us in this room don't let the opportunity to go by, go by to tell your story, not the great things you did. Talk about your failures and how you overcame those. I, I think back to my grandfather, who for 58 years was a restaurateur in New Orleans. Tony Angelo was his name. I can remember him telling me, he, he would tell me all the horrible stories he went through. Clashing with the mob, losing the restaurant, or whatever it was. But those are the lessons that I remember most. When you get older, those are the things you need. We don't want to hear about your glorious tales. We want to know how you overcame hardship. We need to pass those stories along candidly and excitingly to children and to the next generation. And I'll leave you where I started with Peter Pan. It's a great line from Peter Pan I've always loved. The moment you doubt whether you can fly, you cease to ever be able to do it. The reason birds can fly and we cannot is simply that they have perfect faith. For to have faith is to have wings. So keep reading and flying, and don't forget those wings. Thank you. So we'll do our, oh, I stay here. Oh, this is like a, this is like a presidential press conference. <laughs> I feel very, I feel very officious up here. Right. Somebody's got to take my picture. I'm going to take a picture of you all first. <laughs> smile, guys. Everybody smile. <laughs> oh, you look beautiful. Okay, then you can take mine later. Well, I, I don't know about you, but I've never had 42 minutes go by so fast. I would, I would, I'd like, I'm going to sit back down. We have another 45 minutes. Okay, me. next time. <laughs> Will Wilder 4. We'll be back. No, uh, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you, Ray. Just Thank you. Terrific, terrific. Um, we have time for some questions, uh, if any of you have some. And if you do, if you could just uh, raise your hand and we'll put a microphone in it and have you fire away. So please ask for it here. Thank you for coming. Oh, I'm delighted it was very to be entertaining. here. very entertaining. I have one question. Uh oh. If you could interview Jesse Smollett, what would you ask him? <laughs> if I could interview who? I miss it. Jesse Smollett. Smollett. Jo oh, just, Jesse Smollett. <laughs> what would I ask him? What possessed you, Jesse? Uh, I'd start there. You know what I'd ask him? Truly, I'd, I'd open with, what the hell did you think you'd accomplish by this? Did you really think you'd get away with this? Oh, yeah. And here's the most important question I'd ask him. Anytime you're going to break the law, don't write a check. <laughs> That's A. Okay, that's a really rookie move. But, uh, uh, you know, now he's, now he's copying the plea that he's had uh, drug problems. Yeah. yeah, he's got drug problems. Okay. Um, I think, you know, Laura and I have talked about this a lot this week, and if you watch the show, you kind of saw the fruit of our noodling. We noodle, we'll spend hours kind of kicking, fighting, arguing, and then... The angle falls out, um, like a newborn baby. Oh, look, we got an angle today. Um, and I do think it's a, um, I do think there is a victimhood chic that has caught hold of the country. And again, we've taught kids, oh, this is a wonderful segue, thank you. Um, we have taught kids through stor the stories they watch on the news and the celebrities they worship, that if you're the bigger victim, you win. Yeah. It's not about accomplishment or about bringing something new and exciting or innovation or uplifting people or bringing a mark something to market or employing people. That's not rewarded. It's being the bigger victim. That is how you win. And you've got Colin Kaepernick, multi-million dollars, yeah. took yeah. his knee, destroyed an industry for a year, Almost put the NFL out of business. They lost hundreds of millions, probably billions of dollars between tickets and, and swag and, and, and endorsements. 
But then he goes on and gets a $100 million Nike deal. Yeah. So what, what's the lesson for the kids? I'll tell you what it is. Yeah. Paying the, oh, and then they gave him a settlement th this past week. So victimhood pays. That's what Jesse Smollett was, that's clearly why he did this. He wanted to be a big star. He didn't want to keep hanging behind Taraji. I don't blame him, but there's a difference between he and Taraji Henderson. She's talented. She is. Well, and I know Taraji, so. Uh, right Kiss here. my friend Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Ray. I'm delighted to be here. Is it, I'm assuming the mic is on and you can hear me? Yeah. Okay. Loud and clear. Uh, your, your insight's very profound. And I've watched this happen over my lifetime mm -hmm. of seeing the family deteriorate into what we are right now. And it really does start at the family unit. Yep. Uh, and we can go have a long conversation about that. Mm. But to point out a, a factor that even good people are doing that I feel like is uh, contributing to this. On the way over here, my wife was telling me a story about this young gentleman in Texas that is having a chocolate stand or a hot chocolate stand. Yeah. And there, he's received a, a ton of grief about it. Yeah. And now they've set up some kind of a way that you can, you can give them, give this child money uh, as a countermeasure. And I said, that's exactly the wrong story to teach this kid because he's teaching him to be a victim is more profitable than to be an entrepreneur. I agree with you. So I agree my, with question, you. my question for you is, yeah. uh, it, and sometimes I think we've gone too far. There is no return because this is over a 20 or a 30 year period of time. That well, let, let me tell you, the people who got us to this position, they took the 20 and 30 year long view. You need to take it now too. The, the only way back is to, is to take small and decisive steps in the right direction. You, you can't just say, oh, well, it's lost now. No, 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 no. It's, there's also a sw I mean, you're going to see the pendulum swing. Yeah. I tend to agree with you, though, about that, that child. Uh, Laura and I talked about this this week. I'm not crazy about the idea of politicizing kids. I don't like that. I know he's raising money to build the wall, but you're, you're five. Come on. <laughs> if dad wants to go build a wall and start a fund, OK. But I don't like recruiting little kids into it. Your kids, my children, by the way, on social media, you'll never see a picture of my children. My oldest is 19, my youngest is 15. I do that because my feeling is I'm a public figure. That's hard and bad enough. They don't need to be public figures. They shouldn't be. I mean, it's just, uh, and then you're attached to whatever your parents thought or, it's, it's, I don't want them to benefit nor be punished for whatever I did. They have to be their own people. Um, but I, I, agree with your, I agree with your insight on this victimhood thing. It's, um, it creeps in in ways people don't even see because it's cultural. It's something in the culture. Yes, ma'am. Yes. Oh, oh, the lady in the back, and then you. You're next. Oh, I'll be like Trump. No, no, <laughs> no, no, no. I said no. You, you in the back. You're fake news, but go. One question. <laughs> go. Be quiet, be quiet, I'm trying to hear. Get her out of here, get her out of here. Oh, Go ahead. It's really simple. Uh, should I be buying the other two books to read this one? How many do you have, how many kids do you have? I have one 12 year old. Oh well, of course you should buy them all. <laughs> <laughs> yes, here's why. Now they are self-contained adventures, but um, there, there are there's big character arcs and things pay off in book three that won't pay off, and then there are other things that are going to pay off in later books. But the, the characters do mature through the series, but they are self-contained adventures. So, but it's the whole family. I mean, you, you know, the woman who bought my series, Barbara Marcus at Random House, also bought uh, Harry Potter, that little story. You might have heard about it. <laughs> um, 20 years ago, she bought Harry Potter, and she urged... Joanne Rowling not to age Harry Potter. And she did, as we all know. And what happens is, and you can see it in the sales of the book, and of course, if you've read the books, my, my kids stopped reading, I think, at like book four or five. And the reason was because the books got very dark and Harry got older than they were. So it was like it moved beyond their experience. So they were like, Ugh, you know, I'm not, I don't need to go there. So Barbara urged me to leave Will at 12 years old throughout the series, so I have. And I think that's the right decision for middle grade fiction because kids like to read in a 
blaze. They go one, two, three, four. They'll burn through the whole series. I mean, these kids, I, I literally got a note today. This girl got the book and devoured the whole thing in five hours. <laughs> if I could write a quarter that fast. <laughs> <laughs> it only takes me a year to write the thing. But, but yeah, you could, it's fun to have them all. And I, I urge you, read them as a family because in the foreground is an adventure for kids. It's like a thrill ride for kids. In the background is something for adults. And I loved books like that, like Peter Pan. I, go, I went back, when I was reading my children Peter Pan or reading them Treasure Island, I'm weeping like a baby reading it to them. They're like, Daddy, what's wrong? And I'm like, oh, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Because as an adult, you come to it with different eyes. You will see things in Will Wilder that your kids will not see now, but you'll get it. It's really about, uh, it's really about our gifts, the gifts we're given. I mean, Will has his supernatural gifts, but a lot of the other characters do too, his family. But it's also about how, as parents, we try to, we think we're protecting our kids by keeping them back from our mistakes or from our when we went out on a limb and got burned, we want to protect them. But that may not be their path. Their gift might be different than yours. And we see that struggle. It's a good instinct, but it doesn't always work. So you see the characters grappling with that too. They all grow. They all change. Somebody was here. Yes, ma'am. There she is. <laughs> One question, no follow-up. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, my question is, my children fell in love with reading with Harry Potter. Uh -huh. And later, she comes out and she says, this character's gay, or this is this, and this is that. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of ruined it for us. Mm. Uh, not so much my kids, they could care less. But yeah. I thought, boy, if I would have known that she was going to do all that, I would not have encouraged my kids to continue to read her. Yeah. And I just yeah. wanted to know, you kind of said that your boys just quit reading it, but would you recommend Harry Potter? Um... <laughs> I, I'll say this. Let me say this about Harry Potter. I've only read like the first three books because then I ran out of steam on them. They get too, they're too much. It's just too much. They're not that good. But she brilliantly has conceived a world. Obviously, kids love to enter the world, of the wizarding world. They like to go there. It's a magical place. So the vision she had, and it is a battle between good and evil. That's grand, and that's right down the middle of C.S. Lewis and Tolkien Lane. Uh, the truth of the matter is, I know she made those pronouncements 20 years after she bought her latest country with the royalties, <laughs> but when it was safe for her to do so. But um, there's no evidence in those books that those characters, sexuality is in no way expressed. There's nothing, I've asked, my, now my son ended up reading them all, and he's got friends who are obsessive about it. They take notes, they reread it, they dress up, they have parties. It's, anyway, I, you know, I should be so lucky. But um, <laughs> when everybody's wearing pith helmets, call me. Um, <laughs> but I, so that's kind of politi politicizing again, beloved characters. I don't like that. I, I, I rant on this almost every day on the Ingram angle. Sports should be sports. Entertainment should be entertainment. I, I once interviewed Tim Conway, who I love, whom you all should pray for. He's, he's ill, I understand. Um, and I asked him once, why was the Carol Burnett show such a hit, and why does it continue to be this great thing? And he said, well, first of all, we loved each other. And Carol was the most generous star. She would, she would lose a laugh to give us two. She, she was so generous as a star. She didn't have to get every laugh. She would do the setup and step back and let you have the moment. And you remember those moments. Tim Conway would like slay the whole room for 20 minutes. And then he said something else. He said, you remember, Laugh-In was on at the time. There was very political entertainment because Nixon was in the White House. Carol Burnett, they brought her once a Nixon sketch, and she said, we're not doing this. And they said, well, why not? And they fought with her. And she said, I'm not cutting my audience in half. <laughs> That's the right answer. And I feel that way about sketch comedy, music, sports, and children's books. Let the story live. Don't put your political claptrap on top of story once they're beloved characters. Because you're manipulating, and I think hurting your audience. You can't do that, because it's not your, Will Wilder is not my character anymore. He was mine before he was published. Now he belongs to the people who've read him. 50% of that is in here, 
in my reader's head and heart. He's theirs. So for me to now say, well, you know, Will is really Jill Wilder. <laughs> in book five, <laughs> cheerleading squad. No, I, you don't do that. You, you manipulate, you, you hurt. I, I just think you're toying with the emotions of your character, and it would be like someone in your life, you think they're one thing, and then all of a sudden you find out they're head of the mob. It's, it's, why would you do that? I think it's cruel to your audience. I think she should not have said that. If she wants to write that book, go write it now. Well, she is writing it now. <laughs> she is writing it now in that new, um, the, the prequel, uh, the, I don't know, Fantastic Beast or whatever is Dumbledore and the bad guy actually are. So she's back, but, but that's not in the Harry Potter books. She's going back and smacking that in. I, I don't know where the audience is for that. I don't know. Kids don't care about that. You said it yourself. Kids don't care about that, so why are we making a big deal about it? It's sexuality. They're kids. That's the other problem. I don't like the sexualizing kids thing. I don't like it at all. And we've taught far too much of it. We, there's a lot of it. Not in kids lit so much, but it's in other places. Anybody else? Yes? Yes. Yes, sir. Oh, wait, they're coming with a mic. Oh, wait, oh, there's somebody in the back. I'm sorry. Sit down. Sit down. Not your turn. <laughs> Didn't you, did you see that press conference? Oh, I love it. Oh, my God. The Rose Garden, there was not a petal on a rose after that <laughs> press conference. <laughs> Woo! Yes, ma'am. In the back. Uh, hi, Raymond. Hi. I really like the series. Uh, my mom's been reading it with me. And, I love it. Uh, my grandma uh, really enjoys watching EWTN, so I wanted to know if, like, EDF. EWTN was going to partner with you and maybe create uh, a visual series <laughs> on EWTN with the Will Wilder. EWTN? <laughs> yeah, they were going to shoot it on microfiche. Uh, I don't. <laughs> yeah, I, I will tell you a little secret. I am in talks with a studio to adapt the Will Wilder books into films. Yeah, great. <laughs> but secret. That studio is not EWT. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, they, have, they, do, they do their things well, and then there are other people who do other things well. So, but, they, but I promise you, you'll like it, and I'm going to be producing it, so I'll make sure it stays true to <laughs> what it's supposed to stay. Great. Great. I do think you have to honor the story. You know, as a writer, I don't predetermine the ends of these stories. I'm not trying to cram moral lessons down. Now, things inevitably will fall out. But you, you, you stack the dominoes up, and then you let them fall. You don't get to redirect them at the end or, or, or remake characters after you've already made them. You let the character and the story tell itself. And as an author, they become very real to you. So, and there are many times where I thought I had an outline, and he was going to do this, and then in this moment, Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. he went that way. So I had to throw the end of the outline out and you re-outline things and you move. You have to be flexible with the characters in the story. And I, I try to be. And that's why the audience is genuinely surprised when they read it, because you're genuinely surprised when you write it. <laughs> now that's scary, it's a scary thing. But you have to be true and let it happen. You can't fight it. Or it's, you've read those books that are just, nothing happens, or it's so predictable. I'll come to you in a second, I'm going, there's a, yeah. someone over here. Yes, sir. Well, first of all, enjoyed your talk very much. Oh, thank you. And uh, speaking of cutting an audience in half, what are your thoughts about you uh, as an author and others, especially for the younger generation, and the relationship between that and these kids with their iPhones who can't even look up from them? Are they well, even reading anymore? I've seen a lot of non-reading. There, there is... There is a drop-off of reading. The statistics tell us there is a drop-off because kids are spending more and more time on screens and individual screens. Now, what I don't like, I'll give you a little, I'm going to ruin the third book for you a little bit. Um, in the third book, a DJ comes to town and he starts playing this music and it's bewitching music and the whole town is swept up in it. Young people love it, old people love it. But they all, and they all have their earbuds because they're just in their zone and they're loving it and it's just my little moment. And you see the isolation in the town of Perilous Falls. Now, I didn't intend to tell this story, but that's what happens in the story. 
And it does speak to the isolation I think we have in our society today. People are isolated. You see it in homes. I have to show, look, we, make, I, we have to make an effort in our home because the kids want to, oh, I'm going to go watch this and Rebecca's going to watch some old creaky thing about the queen and, uh, you know, <laughs> and, and I'm writing and uh, somebody else is watching a YouTube video at Disney World and everybody's in their own little corner of the world. So you can't do that. You have to make an intentional effort to say, devices in the basket up front, which we do, and we watch things together, we go to things together, and you have something called conversation, which is a lost art. Um, I think, but reading, if you read, to, if you read with kids, here's, the, here's why I advocate reading with kids and reading with the elderly, because we forget about the elderly. Elderly are ignored, they're alone, they need those emotional bonds, and when you watch the stats on them, like if they're hooked up to machines, and people are reading with them and spending time, everything levels off, everything becomes, everything normalizes. Um, so it works for children, it works for middle age, and it works when we're at the end of life. Um, the most important thing is this, when you read, and you, certainly when you read my books, you inevitably are going to stop, and the kid's gonna go, what's Joan of Arc's helmet? Who's Joan of Arc? Good question. Now, I explain it, but it gives the parent and the kid a chance to learn something together. I mean, it's, it, it, and because my books are kind of historical, there's a lot of moments for the parent or the grandparent or the aunt or uncle to stop. The kid will inevitably ask. That conversation happens when you're reading together. But I think if you give a kid a story they want to read, they'll read it. Am I right, boys? <laughs> I mean, if you really want a story, and let them lead you. There's certain stories kids just don't want to, just because we like Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm, my son does not want to look at a cover with a little girl in a calico dress on. He's not going to read it. <laughs> I know they say he should. Some of the reading specialists or teachers say, well, you're going to read Rebecca of Sunnybrook Farm. <laughs> and he says no, and he fails the test. But We've got to let them read the things they're interested in. It might be trucks, it might be science, it might be space, it might be animals or monsters or lizards or cat guts. It could be anything. But let them go, if you let them read and you guide them a little bit, they'll find their way to Huck Finn and Shakespeare and Moliere. But you gotta let them be where they are. And I do think too early we cram things that are that are not they're not ready for either linguistically or intellectually, they're just not ready for it yet. And we force it on them at an early age and they never go back to that. Shakespeare, the, the bard is law, I love, I was a Shakespearean actor for years, I love Shakespeare. He, it, it, I, I'm one of the fools driving, I'm, I'm on the 405 here, I've got John Gielgud reciting Shakespeare on. I love Shakespeare, I could marinate in it all day. Um, but a, a kid who's 10 is not gonna wanna hear it. They just don't wanna hear it and you've got to introduce them to the story and show it to them and then give them the text, not the other way around. I took my kids to see Shakespeare and then they got it in school because then they have a visual reference, they know the story, and then they can appreciate the, the beauty of the language. I'm sorry, I'm bloviating. Anybody, who else? We have time for one One more, what, what's the rush, John? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 I know, we got, we, they, I mean, he's good, they're gonna throw us all out, There'll no security, be, the lights will go out. No, but, but before we, we do end, I just wanna remind everyone that uh, Ray's gonna be signing his books afterwards, so hopefully all of you can come and this When you buy your three copies, I'll be signing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Not forgetting. <laughs> I guess. Yes, uh, ma'am. In yellow? No? Yeah. Yes? Yeah, no. that'd be fun. Oh, You're very colorful. Okay, great. Hi. I brought my visual aid because I'm as nervous as I'll get out, but. Um, I, I love that. <laughs> what is the Sharknado thing you brought there? What? No, this is Destiny. She's a low vision character. Oh. And to just, um, the, the literacy rate for students with low vision is incredibly, incredibly worse than what you're describing for wow. people with regular vision. And I just kind of stumbled into low vision as a teacher. Mm -hmm. special education just for three years. So I'm basically a newbie. So um, I, it would be great to have more characters with low vision and I wanted to share a story with you. Okay. A researcher named Ann Korn was consulted with Sesame Street. Yep. And, and they said, okay, how would you like us to represent blind kids in our, this is 1970s. Right. And she said, you need to have two characters. You need to have one that's completely no vision and one that has low vision or you know, bumps into mm. things. Mm -hmm. 
And Sesame Street said, uh-huh, yeah, uh -huh. checklist, checklist. The only child they featured was one with completely no vision at all. Oh. So if you want to talk about isolation, we have kids that don't know how to make eye contact because oh. they don't have the vision. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not really a question, I guess, but it would be exciting to see students represented with low vision that aren't the evil albino. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. people who bump into walls, but they're good natured, you know, so. This was a nice start, but it's Disney. I'd like to see a Rimmin and Royo. Okay, <laughs> I'll, I'll put that in the back. I will tell you, there is a character, and uh, it's, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. I, there's a little boy, I, uh, and I know his mother quite well, Jenny Stepanek, who suffers from a very rare um, form of muscular dystrophy. And when I wrote the character of Max Merriweather, who's in all three books, Max is confined to a wheelchair. He is suffering not only from autism, but from this rare form of muscular dystrophy, and sometimes they go hand in hand. Now, I wrote, I wrote him because Max is the only one who has these premonitions and dreams of what's about to happen to his friends and the community. And I think sometimes, particularly the people I've known with severe disabilities and, 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 and you know, special needs, we ignore them. They're often so ignored but in their quiet, they see much more than we do. So I thought I wanted to develop that character. I get more letters from parents and kids with, who are wheelchair bound or disabled because, so Max is a much bigger part of this story than he was in the last, in the first book. He's bigger in the second book and he's really big in the third. And he's got, in a later book, this kind of a story that's all his. But, um, I am very sensitive to that because when I go to schools, I see kids and they come to me and they say, and, and you know, they're in their wheelchairs and they say, thank you for writing Max. I see myself in Max. It's important for kids to see themselves, boys and girls of all varieties, shapes, colors and sizes, as well as uh, special needs. So I, it's there. It's there in that way. I'll keep the sighted, the low sighted in the back of my mind, but, um, and he's not alone. There are other kids who have well, everybody's got, I, we all have special needs in our own way. We just have to recognize it and, and respect it because sometimes those are gifts in hiding. Just because everybody doesn't applaud it doesn't mean it's not a gift. One more and then we'll go or we want to go now? <laughs> One more, okay. One more and then we'll go. And uh, John, well, I need to take a picture. Somebody's got to take a picture of me at the podium just so I can say I had my presidential address <laughs> here at the Reagan Library. <laughs> No, no, let me do the, no, no. Okay, now I'll do one, now get one where I look nice and not so dictatorial. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, one more, yes sir. Yes sir, then we'll go sign books, then we'll go and eat Mexican after that. <laughs> Uh, my wife stayed home with our kids and read a book to them, and they loved it. And my, my grandkids are being taught the same way. And I look around, and I see so many women having to work out of the house, and nobody at home, nobody to read to them. And then I'm watching the government saying, it takes a village to raise kids. I think that's so wrong. Mm. It takes a family. Mm. And I find that the kids that come from a... a Intact family do much better as adults. Mm -hmm. And it comes from talking, reading, and with my own grandkids, I tell them where I screwed up. And they, uh, what, you did that? <laughs> but it's, Good. It, I, I just love it. And it, it, it comes around reading, it comes around talking and doing things together. And uh, what's happening now, my grandkids are giving books for Christmas. Oh, well, thank so you. So I just, just wanted to think, we need to change. The outlook of, of a stay-at-home mom's a pretty important person. Well, yes, and look, I, I, to, to do nothing to disparage working mothers, because my mother was a working mother, but when she came home after working all day, cooking his dinner, going through the homework, making sure we were bathed and brushed our teeth on occasion, she would make sure the last 10 minutes of the day, we would sit at the edge of the bed and she would read to us and it became a ritual. And when she was, I, I can remember days she was like bone tired, like, and we'd say, no, mom, we gotta read the story. And she'd <laughs> drag herself back to the bed and read the story. But those moments are so precious and important. Doesn't matter how long, do it even in little bits. It's about time spent. Kids really wanna be close to you, they do. And, and, and those bonds, I think, last right to the end of life.
Yeah. Okay, we'll go sign books. I'll Great. see you in there. Thank you very much, Greg. Thank, Thank you. you. Great time. Thank you. I'm going to take one more. <laughs> okay, everybody smile. <laughs> All right, we got oh, it. Careful. <laughs>